James has a Yamaha six horsepower outboard engine. He wants to know, is it normal for the water pee out to be hot? Well, James, I appreciate you subscribing and thank you for the comment. Of course, it's supposed to be hot. So when you think about what's going on, uh, well, hold on here. I guess it also, I should probably say it depends on how hot we're talking. Like, is it boiling hot? Do you see steam coming off of the water? Because that's going to be excessively hot. But by and large, it should be warm. Like you should be able to put your hand under the telltale and to feel the water temperature and, you know, be able to have your hand there. It might get to the point where, you know, it might get a little hot on your hand, but you should be able to touch the water. You shouldn't be able to like touch it and then pull back or you're going to get, you know, burned. If you're going to get burned, then that's, that's a little too hot because when you think about it, what exactly is happening is the water that is cooling the power head is immediately being put out the telltale. So usually the telltale is, especially on a six horsepower outboard, a six horsepower, there's, you know, one cylinder. So it's, there's not much going on there. It is just from the power head straight out the telltale. You're getting the water that is directly touching the cylinder walls and all the inside of the engine. So it's absorbing all the heat that it can and then being put out right out the telltale. So of course it's going to be a little bit hot, but it shouldn't be boiling hot if that makes any sense to you. I don't know, you know, what the exact temperature should be probably like 130 140 somewhere around there so yeah it's going to be hot but it's not going to be like 200 or 180 degrees or something like that because that is going to be excessively hot and if it's like boiling then yeah that's a problem you've got a heating problem and the engine is getting way too hot so hope that answers your question without you know putting it into any less general terms it all depends on the engine the larger engines most of the thermostats are about 143 degrees 150 somewhere around in there so the telltale water that comes out of the engine is going to be somewhere around that temperature so it is going to be hot but it's not going to be boiling hot and then richie says i have an older outboard with no flush port if i put a water hose fitting on the telltale hose and put water backwards through the system would this flush the system it's a yamaha two-stroke going to be in a slip trying to make a way to flush it easily yes that will work so you don't tell me what um, horsepower it is but that's basically how the flushing system works on most modern four strokes that are out there that have flush ports built into them. Even some of the, you know, OX66, HPDI, stuff like that, they have flush ports too. And the flush ports are basically just right there in line. Since you're talking about a two stroke and it's on your tender, I'm guessing it's like a nine horsepower or something smaller. And so I would say, yeah, if you take the telltale. The only thing about that is that you're going to need to put a check valve somewhere in there. And it's going to be difficult because the telltale is coming right off of the engine. However, whatever engine, it's going to be different based on where it is, if it comes off a fuel cooler or whatever. But on a two-stroke, it's generally just going to come off of the block somewhere and it's going to go out. So in order to be able to put water to it and then flush back through, you're going to need to you know, put a way to not met, not allow the water to flow out of the telltale, but then back flush through everything. Most flushing systems on four strokes that are come from the factory have a like a like a Y valve or a duckbill valve or something like that where it's just a, a valve and it's closed like this. But then when you put the hose to it, it opens it up and flushes it backwards. So. If you put it to the telltale, it's going to flush most of the engine because it's just the way it's going to be. And it's going to vary based on your engine model. I would say that there's definitely a way for you to do that. What I would do is probably go to partsview.com or boats.net.com and look up your specific engine model. Go to the cooling system or the cooling hoses, whatever it may be, and then look at the diagram and see how all the routings are for the cooling system. And then based on that, you can figure out, well, if I hook into the telltale, how much of my system is going to get flushed and how much is not going to get flushed. So that would be the 
best way to do it. Will it work? Probably. Will it work on every model? Possibly not. Eagle, can you install heat exchanger on outboards? There's another one. I, you know, is it possible? Probably. Will it take a lot of engineering and a lot of work? I would say definitely. Because the way an outboard cooling system works is that it picks up water from the lower unit. It is run through a water tube to the bottom of the power head usually. And then from there, it is distributed out throughout the entire power head. And then based on the routings from there, there be there will be a thermostat somewhere in the system to then regulate the temperature of the water as well as most engines are going to also have the water routed through things like oil coolers through fuel coolers through rectifier regulators to cool them through air coolers so you know it cools air which is going to vary based on what model of engine you have and so in order to create a heat exchanger that operates on that entire system and then be able to close off the water tube and also the exhaust because it just dumps all the water out the exhaust which in turn cools the exhaust and then on certain models like the Yamaha F350 the exhaust water also cools coming out the propeller what I mean by that is that on like an F350 Yamaha lower unit there is a tube it's a little metal tube that goes down into the bottom of the lower unit where the water comes out and then it comes up it comes over to where the anode is and right there where the anode is it has like a little scoop that picks up water that then forces that water through that tube and then down and that cools the propeller hub so if you have just straight exhaust coming out there and there's no way like you know on most outboards that water that cools the block is then coming out the exhaust which helps to cool the exhaust if you get rid of that water the exhaust is going to be a lot hotter and if it's a lot hotter you can like if you have different types of hubs for your propeller it can melt the rubber it can mess up the hub because the heat is going to be too much and so if you put a heat exchanger on the outboard and get rid of that cooling water that is cooling the exhaust, then you might have other problems that then come up based on that issue of, you know, you're, you're changing the functionality of the cooling and the exhaust system and the way that they work together. So is it possible? A hundred percent it's possible because seven Marine uses a uh, heat exchanger and a closed loop cooling system. So it's definitely possible, but is it as efficient? Not really, because the biggest problem with outboards is everybody wants to complain about the weight. And when it goes from a two stroke to a four stroke, you have a whole lot more weight because you have a lot more internal components. And so the weight goes up significantly. And then if you add more parts like a heat exchanger, my guess is you're going to be adding a lot more weight to it. So um, that is going to be another factor in there and probably why most outboards are raw water cooled and they don't have closed loop cooling systems on them is most likely for a weight reason opposed to anything else. And then also just the efficiency of using the raw water to cool the entire engine and then go out the exhaust. It's, it's just an efficient way of of running the system. So that's just kind of my thought there. I'm sure there are R and D and manufacturers and people that spend their entire lives and their jobs dedicated to those systems. So they would have a lot better of an opinion than me. Elite driver. Can you put an ECU from a Yamaha 200 on a 150? Will it give me more power? So that's going to depend because are we talking two stroke? Or are we talking four stroke? Now, if we're talking two stroke, yeah, most of the 150s and the 200s, that's basically the same. I don't know if the carburetors are any different on that, like the two strokes. I don't know if the 150, 200 carburetors are any different. Like if you're talking a 150, 200 HPDI, then yeah, you just swap out that CDI and um, or that ECU, and yeah, you'll get that horsepower. On the four-stroke system, though, that is completely different because now there are some variables in there. So the 150... F-150 Yamaha four-stroke is a 2.7 liter engine mechanically. The digital is a 2.8. 
The 2.7 and the 2.8 are two completely different systems, and they are just completely different. It used to be that the 150-200 were, you know, you would look at the 200 as a, its own entity because it was completely different. On the 2.7 liter, like a mechanical 150, it has a different ignition system, whereas like the 2.8, it has coil over plug or cop ignition coils, which are... You know, there's an actual single ignition coil that goes over every spark plug, whereas the F-150 doesn't use that system. It uses a completely different system. And then there are other factors about it that are just completely different in the way it operates. So if you've got a digital F-150, that one is, I'm pretty sure, a 2.8. And theoretically, yeah, I think that that would probably work, but... Again, you get into all these different models and swapping stuff. I mean, that's a lot to remember, all those different things. I want to say the F-150 digital is a 2.8 liter, and yeah, it, that might work. It would probably work, but I'd have to do some investigating on that one because that's a lot of information that I can't pull off the top of my head. Poor Sportsman. The best deal is the motor that you can have the best dealer relationship with. I have a five-month-old hard water season. I don't want to wait on any parts after the melt. Having a symbiotic relationship with the dealer reduces open water downtime. Purchasing a boat, parts, and services gets you some leverage and a desire in the dealer to have a long, successful relationship. Yes, that goes a long, long way, especially for you northern you know, boaters that do have these hard set seasons where maybe you only have a three, a four, a five month season of, you know, once the snow melts, once everything stops freezing, the water temperature comes up and you don't get these freezing temps at night where you have a problem with, you know, getting the water out of your engine before it freezes and destroys the block. Then yeah, if you've got a very short season for boating, downtime can be a big problem. In a lot of places where you're on lakes, like different states, there might be hundreds of miles between lakes. And so there's only going to be one dealership that has like boating supplies. It's not like in Florida where you've got a West Marine in every other town and you've got marinas and shops and dealers and like all these different places and suppliers for marine parts where you know if your boat goes down because the propeller or whatever it's just a drive down the street to a dealership where you can get a part come back put it on and that's it you're good to go whereas up there you might not have a shop for 70 80 100 miles to get to the lake and so if you go to the lake and you got a problem with your boat I mean, it, it could be down for a week. It could be down for two weeks. They might have to order a part. They might not have access to parts. Like if you only have a Mercury dealership and you've got a Honda engine and you need a Honda part and you've got to order from somewhere, where partsview.com, I mean, that, you know, that kind of eliminates that because you can order online, but you've got to do the work yourself. So having a dealer relationship is, is kind of a big deal for a lot of people, especially if you don't do stuff yourself, then that dealer relationship goes a long way. And like he said, the desire of the dealership to work on your stuff, their dealerships, unfortunately, I mean, I don't know if I'd say unfortunately, but the reality is that, yeah, dealerships will prioritize people over other people. That's just the way it works. So somebody that comes in off the street that it's going to sound bad, but somebody that comes in off the street and has a problem with their boat and it's just a simple fix or it's something that's like, it's not a life or death threatening situation or this charter captain over here that spends $20,000 a year with that dealership, this charter captain is going to get priority over the guy off the street. That's just the way it is. And most dealerships are going to, they have a way of breaking the bad news to people or putting off the work and saying, oh, we need a part or we need this or we need that. People do get prioritized. If someone comes in and spends $150,000 and buys a boat and then they get their service done there every single you know year, then if that person has a problem, when they come in, they're probably going to get to the front of the line because that's the way it is. They know that every year this person's going to be buying a service. He's going to be buying fuel. He's going to be buying parts. He buys all his, his bait, his tackle, his ice, like all stuff. The person might spend $10,000 a year with this one shop, and that one shop sees the one person off the street. You come in, you're going to spend $50 and never see you again, 
Whereas this guy, I see him every other week and they're friends. They go fishing together. Like that relationship is there. The guy's going to get priority over the other person. And I mean, that's just kind of life though. Like that's not really like a dealership or, or this or that. Like that's just the way business works. Like your neighbors, your family, friends, family. Like, I mean, that's just people prioritize other people over other people just because it's just the way it is. You know, it's like kind of it's life. So having that dealer relationship, yes, yeah, definitely beneficial because like he said, if you've got only five months to, you know, use your boat, then being down for two, three, four weeks, you know, to lose an entire month, that's a big deal. And having that dealer relationship to make sure that you are going to get your parts, you're going to get the service, you're going to get what you need and have priority. That goes a long way. Jason says, if only one piston is leaking, is it okay to follow the same steps with just one side, leaving the other side in place? We're talking about working on a trim system here. So most trim units have a tilt system and then a trim system. Kind of the difference in that is trimming has two rams on the bottom. So you get basically three points of pressure. So when you're underway, the boat's going through the water like this propeller is giving you thrust going, you know, down or forward. And whenever you trim the engine up, it lifts the boat out of the water. And that trim uses the two rams and the tilt rod in order to be able to withstand the pressure or the thrust of the propeller pushing the outboard back in. And then once you get like, you know, to go put it on a trailer, there's no thrust. So the trim rams only are active or being used during, you know, a trimming with the engine running, whereas tilt is just to trailer the engine. You just need to lift the engine out of the, out of the you know, all the way up. So kind of the difference between the tilt and the trim, but we're talking about doing, there's usually two trim rams. So if one is leaking and the other one is not leaking, then yeah, same procedure. You can just take the one off fix the leak, whatever it may be, whether it's the cap, whether it's the O-rings, whether it's the dust seal or the trim seal, and then fill it back up, put it back together. No problems. hundred percent. You can do them individually. You can do them all together. You can do just a tilt. You can do just one trim ram. Like there's no need in doing all of them at the same time. You can just do one of them at a time if you need to. So yeah, you can do one. Not a problem there, Jason. Mr. Tino. I can use ATF fluid in a Showa unit on a 2006 Suzuki DF-175. I mean, you could use ATF in pretty much every trim unit. It's just, you know, it's hydraulic fluid. So ATF, Dextron 3 or 4, I'm not sure about the Dextron, but um, I want to say it's Dextron like 3 or 4 or whatever, whatever it is. But yeah, automatic transmission fluid. It's a hydraulic fluid. It's it's going to work. Yeah, that's that's what most trim units are using N- nowadays. I mean, it's interesting the ATF, like if you look at power pole and they have biodegradable hydraulic fluid, it's kind of interesting. I wonder what they're, maybe I don't know, or maybe there's something that, you know, hasn't been figured out with. But I would think that, you know, if power pole can make a biodegradable hydraulic fluid, to use with the power pole, you would think that we could make the same biodegradable fluid to put into trim units and steering units. And then if you do have a leak, then we aren't polluting anything and it not be a problem, but just kind of a side note. Yeah. ATF is fine. That's what 90% of people are putting in there just because ATF is five bucks a bottle and some of the trim fluid bottles are 20 bucks a bottle. So especially on older stuff like, you know, 2006, you're talking about a, what is that? 14, 18 year old engine. It, it might already have, it probably already has ATF in the, in the unit already. David, great video, but one question, shouldn't the Rams be retracted when you fill up with fluid? I don't know how much this type of trim system I don't know much about this type of trim system, but on my IO cylinders, they have to be retracted to fill the reservoir or it will overfill. Found that out the hard way and made a mess. So yeah, on these trim systems, no, you don't, you, you fill them up, put the caps in and their reservoirs on the top. So yeah, there's, you, you want to fill them up before, because if you don't fill them up before you put your trim rams in there, which two different systems. Like you're talking about IO is completely different than these, you know, trim units that are on an outboard because it's a lot more encapsulated and on a 
IO, you've got a pump inside the boat, and and there it's it's just a little bit different. So the filling them before, you want to do that because if you don't fill them before, you're going to have all that air in there. So if you have all that air in there, when you go to fill the unit up, if you let the you can you can airlock it is basically what happens where the pump runs dry and the pump is only going to push fluid. So if you get it airlocked, then the pump, you're going to hit the switch. The pump's going to run. Nothing's going to happen. And the only way to get rid of the airlock is to then lower the engine down. And if you don't have like a forklift or it is, you know, you don't have a come along, you don't have something to be able to let the engine down and then to be able to pick it back up. Most of the time that can be a real pain to do because if you've got, let's say a 300 horsepower outboard, picking that thing up by yourself by hand is, I mean, like good luck. You're going to destroy your back trying to do that. Now, if you have that air in there, you want to let the engine down because it's going to push everything up into the reservoir And then when you fill it up, that pressure on everything is going to allow you to get fluid back to the pump. So you're going to fill it up and then, you know, you would undo the manual release valve and then fill it up and then pick it up and then be filling it up as you pick it up until you can get fluid back to the pump in order to then use the pump. But at that point in time, if you airlock it and you let the engine all the way down, most of the time the trim unit getting access to the trim unit is a big problem. Like to be able to fill it with the outboard down, that can be a problem depending on the model because you can't get to the, to the bleeder valve or the fill cap. So those are two things to be thinking about. There is it airlocks the system and that's why you fill it up pre also same thing with a Verado. Those things are another one that you can overfill. And if you overfill it, the caps will pop off and you will blast fluid all over the back of the boat. So just like your IO, if you do a Verado's trim system that same way, you don't want to overfill it because you're asking for problems. So definitely a good topic. Troy Parker, can I still run my Verado with the drive shaft seal leaking? So what we're talking about here for context, everybody, the drive shaft on the lower unit goes up through the oil pump and through an oil pump drive gear. There are oil seals and water seals on that drive shaft. And if those seals fail, it will leak oil out of the um, drive shaft into the water. So in the short, yes, you can run the engine with the drive shaft seal leaking. In the long, how long are you trying to run the engine? You know, you need to keep an eye on the oil level because it will be dumping oil out. And then two, you're just polluting everything too because now you're just dumping oil out all over the, you know, everywhere you go, you're going to be dumping oil out. So yes and no. Yes, you can run it. You're not going to damage it. If you run it for too long and you run out of oil or you run low on oil, you're going to have other problems because one you're running an engine low on oil is not good because everything's going to get hot Two, you're losing lubrication and you're risking, you know, blowing up your power head. If you run too low, most of the time on a Verado, by the time you run low enough on oil to blow a power head, you have like the oil alarm is going to go off. So there's an alarm that before you even have the opportunity to, you know, run out of oil and lock up your power head, the alarm's going off and you're having, you're in guardian mode. So is that system a hundred percent? Not necessarily. I mean, you could have another problem and you could run out of oil and lock up the power head. So it's not a guarantee that the alarm's going to go off, but that system is pretty well guarded where if you run too low on oil, oil pressure or oil, you know, quantity, you're going to be put into guardian before major damage is done. But at the same time, the oil pump and the oil pump drive gear are going to be running dry. And if they run dry, they can run hot. And when they run hot, you can weld the oil pump drive gear onto the top of the drive shaft. And if that happens, you will not be able to get the lower unit off of the engine. And at this point in time, whenever you do that, then the only way to fix it is to pull the power head off 
And then two, you're going to have to take a hole saw and drill a hole about this big in the side of the drive shaft. And then you're going to have to take a sawzall and cut the drive shaft of the lower unit and then pull it out from the top out. So then you're going to have to replace your oil pump drive gear spindle along with Probably, you know, you might be have damage to your oil pump as well. And then you're going to have to buy a new drive shaft for the lower unit or buy a new lower unit. And then also you're going to have a hole in the drive shaft housing, which you can either run it like that or you got to buy a new drive shaft housing. So do the risks outweigh the gains? I would say yes, that, you know, running low on oil is very bad. Does it take a long time for that to happen? Yes. It takes a few hundred hours for that process to usually happen. But at the same time, it's something that you should be aware of about. You know, if just because I said, yes, you can run the engine with an oil leak, that doesn't mean that you should just continue running the engine for another 400 hours because that's what's going to happen. That's what you're going to end up doing, which is going to cost you thousands and thousands of dollars, if not just junk the outboard. Car Racer says, what do you do if there's grooves worn in the shaft? Talking about the grooves on the drive shaft, it again, goes through those oil seals and the water seals on a Verado. Most of the engines have the same type of system, like most Yamahas and everything else. The drive shaft goes through the oil pump. So there are seals, there's oil seals, there's water seals on that. And if you do develop grooves, a lot of times the grooves are below the seals. So it's not really a problem. But there are instances where something like whatever it may be, you get debris or something up in there and it gets caught in the O-rings or it gets caught up there in where the seals are. The drive shaft spinning at 4,000 RPM, 5,000 RPM, that debris is going to wear into the metal and it will create grooves. So if the grooves are where the seals are, then that is something to is going to have to get addressed. You'll have to replace the drive shaft. But most of the time, the grooves are below where the seals ride. So most of the time, it's not necessarily an issue, but there are instances where it is an issue. If, I, if it was me personally dealing with something like that, I would try and gauge if they're on the seals or not. If it's close, I'm going to put that, I'm going to change the seals and put the lower unit back on there and run it and see what happens. Most likely it's not going to leak. And then, you know, you're going to just let it run. If the thing runs for a hundred hours and then develops an oil leak again, where it's torn up those seals, where the, where the ring is, then you're going to have to change the drive shaft. But at the same time, everything's already been apart, so it's going to be a lot easier. But that's kind of the risk reward. Do you want to go and spend, say, two twenty five hundred dollars on a drive shaft change just because taking the drive taking the lower unit apart and then changing out the drive shaft is going to be a pretty big task on top of buying the drive shaft and all the other parts that go along with it, probably a reseal kit and everything else, and then the time to do it. So what I would probably do is just go ahead and change seals, put the thing back together. And if it's most likely it's not going to leak and you're going to run it. If you develop an oil leak in say a hundred hours, then you're going to have to change the drive shaft. If you don't develop a, uh, an oil leak in a hundred hours, then you save yourself 2,500 bucks. So, or whatever it may be, depending on where you are, the lower unit, the situation, all that. So that's, that's my opinion. That's what I would do is, I would try and run it first. And I, if you're doing this for somebody, then I would let them decide what they want to do because taking apart the lower unit, changing the drive shaft and all that is, or, or just buying a new lower unit. They might as well just buy a new lower unit. So, you know, here's the risk. You can probably get another, if it's going to develop an oil leak, it's probably going to take a few, like it's going to take time. So you can try and write it out and see if it leaks, which is going to save you a lot of money. Or you can go ahead and change it out and spend a couple grand now. And, you know, maybe you needed to, maybe you didn't. It's, I, w I would go that route before changing it. Brad, I've got a question on my Yamaha two stroke starts pretty easy. And then I leave the boat ramp and it feels like half power, not in limp mode. I stop, shut the motor off for a few seconds and turn it back on. And it runs fine for the rest of the day at full power. 
any ideas what's going on? Um, I would say you got a fuel thing going on, and I would just try and prime it up better. So most two strokes, the this the way the fuel system is with carburetors and stuff like that. The a lot of times you can lose your fuel prime, where you're going to have enough fuel in order to start run the engine, but then eventually as you're using it. It'll bog down, it'll die, it'll run out of fuel, whatever, because you lost that fuel prime. So I would just try and prime the engine up, you know, squeeze your primer bulb, hold it vertically. Um, there's a lot of people that, that still don't know that yet. Just You might be new, you might not have never dealt with this before, but a primer bulb has an arrow on it, and you want to take the primer bulb, but you don't want it horizontal. You want to pick it up and have it vertically with the arrow facing up because of the way it creates a suction so inside there there's a a valve and it opens and closes like this and it sucks fuel up so if you've got it vertically you can prime it up and i would try and prime it up and fill the engine you know prime it up to where the primer bulb is hard and see if that gets rid of the problem because most most likely if you're able to do that like if you prime it up and then you shut it off and run for the rest of the day I'm going to be looking at that first before I'm looking at anything else because, you know, for it to run the rest of the day and only have a problem when you first start it and run it, I'm going to say it's it's not getting the right amount of fuel, be my guess. Rob, excellent work. How do I keep my trim motor from corroding so quickly? I sprayed some corrosion blocking spray on it. Depends on the, the unit you're talking about. Like if this is an F350 Yamaha, which is very common, I would paint it. So if you got a problem with your your trim motor corroding, I would sand it and paint it, and the paint is usually what it is. Some of those trim motors, like an F-350, that didn't come, it came prime, but it didn't even come painted, so we would have to paint the trim motors. So that's what I would do. I would, anything that you have trouble with corrosion or something like that, try and paint it, especially on a trim unit, because trim unit, corrosion blocker is not really going to work on it because of the way it is. I mean, it's in the water. So you're always getting water running over it and splashing on it and cleaning it off. So you're, you know, if you put a corrosion blocker or some kind of grease or spray on there, that's just going to wash off and it's going to wash off a lot quicker than you think. So if you sand it and paint it, paint's not going to wash off and it's going to eliminate your, you know, corrosion issue. It might not eliminate it all the way, but it's going to definitely be a good step in the right direction in order to, you know, stop the corrosion. And R. Vieira says, at which point would you decide to just scrap the old center console and just install a new one? I would have dumped the old CC and started a new. This is on a center console that we are doing a dash panel on and stuff like that. Generally, in the boating world, you don't really just scrap a console and put a new one on there because you know things on a boat are built it's pretty custom like you know a they build the consoles and then put them in the boat so let's say you put a bunch of holes in the dash like you're doing a repower you've got old analog gauges you've got a bunch of stuff that with a bunch of holes in the dash and you're trying to make it look clean there's basically two ways of fixing it i mean you could buy a whole new console but that seems wasteful when it's an unnecessary because it's fiberglass and gel coat is what it's built out of. So one, you can just like go to newwiremarine.com or another local company that might be around you that do dash panels, just make an entire dash panel, cover everything up and look, you know, super clean. You can cover it up with starboard and make it yourself super easy, not that big of a deal. And it can look clean. Or if you wanted to have it look, you know, brand new, then you would just fill in all the holes and re-glass it and re-gel coat it. And that's going to give you a fresh brand new canvas, just like if you had a brand new console. So usually you don't just dump center consoles and um, you cover them up, all the old holes, or you fill them with fiberglass and then you will just redrill the way you want it and you've got a blank canvas for the most part maverick wants to know lots of good info i always hear about using not using the gray fuel line with liner but when i go to buy it for projects i don't always know what is the good fuel line quote good 
What brand and miles do you use or would you recommend? Yeah, gray, blue, I wouldn't use any of that. And then also one thing to remember is that there are two different types of ratings. So you have USCG, US Coast Guard ratings for below deck and above deck. So the fuel lines are going to have a rating, whether it can be used below the deck or it can be used above the deck. That's an important thing to be thinking about. I mean, you're going to get on boats and a bunch of boats out there are going to have new fuel line that is not rated for to be below the deck, but someone has been in there and put that in there. So you're going to see it all the time, but just be you know, understanding that there is that rating. And I like Shields. Shields is the most expensive, but it's probably the best. It's what most boat brands are doing from the tank to the water separator is a Shields. I can't think of the exact number of what Shields. It's going to depend on if it's three eighths, half inch, five sixteenths, you know what it is. But Shields is probably the best. Yamaha's got good fuel line. And then also Trident makes a pretty good fuel line. So between those three, that's probably what I'm going to be picking. And other than that, yeah, gray, blue, I wouldn't even, I can't believe they still sell it. I know Mercury Quicksilver still sells a bunch of that gray fuel line. And I don't know why people buy it. Like, honestly, like, I don't even know why they still make it. Maybe they've changed the design or whatever. But to me, if I see gray or I see blue, I'm like, I'm taking that stuff out. Like, I'm not, I'm not dealing with that. Like, it's, it's a problem waiting to happen. And I don't want it to happen on my watch. And I don't want to be held liable or responsible or have the blame of this issue. So that's just my opinion. And that's the fuel hose that I would recommend and what I like to use.